Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Covenant Church Online. I'm glad you've joined us this morning. I hope everyone stayed safe on the 4th of July yesterday. Uh, no burns and uh, only mild indigestion from all the food. Uh, today we have Pastor Greg who will be delivering the sermon, followed by communion. So if you don't have your communion supplies, your, your bread or crackers and, and juice, go ahead and grab that now. And after that, we have some praise and worship led by Greg, accompanied by Michelle on the cello. And then we'll have Casey uh, deliver some announcements. Right now, we have Greg for the message. Well, good morning. Thank you, Justin. It is so good to be with you. Um, my name is Pastor Greg, and we are in the series, Who Do You Say I Am? And this week, we're going to talk about Jesus who says, I am the bread of life. But before we get to that, I just want to give you a brief on our family. I know many of you have been praying for us, and we've learned a little bit more information. As you know, both my wife, Pastor Amanda, and my daughter, Ruby, have been sick now for quite some time. And Ruby was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes this week. And so we were with the good folks at Valley Children's Hospital in Madeira. And we were learning how to help manage diabetes with Ruby. And so uh, just be praying for her. Um, it's just, it's manageable and she's going to be okay. But all the little pricks for a little special girl breaks daddy's heart. So be praying for us. And also for Amanda, because right now um, there's a big question mark over what's going on. She's had... Uh, Fever is now straight for, I believe, over 17 days. And the doctors don't know what's going on. So would you continue to pray for our family um, that we can figure out what's going on and that God would bring healing to her. So uh, with that update, would you join me as we pray together and then we will step into God's word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come as your children before their daddy. And we thank you that you are good. And we thank you that you are with us in every moment of our days. And so, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we bring all of ourselves. We bring the good and the bad. We bring the pain, the sorrow, the joy, and the blessing. And we give them all to you. And, Lord, where we need a little bit of help, we ask for your help. Where we need healing, especially as I think about some of my family members, I pray in Jesus' name for healing. I pray for hope and for love and for joy where it's needed. And God, um, we just praise you that you are the living God. And Lord, we praise you that one day you will put all of this back together and you will heal and redeem everything that you have created. Lord, thank you that you are not silent. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you um, that you are present in this moment. And Lord, you know the chaos of my week and what I've gone through. And so, Lord, I offer my voice and my words to you, that you would use them and guide them according to your will. And, Lord, I trust that for everybody here this morning who's listening online, God, that you would speak to all of our hearts. So help us to hear what you have to say. And I pray this in your precious name. And God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, we are in uh, John chapter 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, maybe you're live right now, so you can't do this, but if you're not live, I suggest take a moment and pause the recording and read John chapter 6. I'll tell you what, John chapter 6 is a roller coaster ride. It's completely crazy. So here's kind of how, what John chapter 6 looks like. In the beginning— Jesus has the miracle where he takes five loaves of bread and two fish, and he feeds 5,000 people. But after that, he disappears, and he goes across the lake, and he hides until the people find him. But when the people find him, they start a little debate about what is bread, and what about the manna from heaven, and the people start to get fussy. And then Jesus gets fussy, and he tells the people to eat his body and to drink his blood, to which they're totally grossed out. And then they keep talking, and eventually the people say, this is a hard teaching, and a ton of people leave. 
Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, well, are you guys going to leave too? And they're like, "Uh uh-uh, we saw you walk on water. We saw your miracles were with you the whole time. And then Jesus says, that's great. But just so you know, one of you is the devil. And that's John chapter 6. And that's where we learn about the bread of life. So what I want to do with us this morning is perhaps give a little bit of order to John 6 and how it works out when we talk about the bread of life and what it means uh, for Jesus and especially the Jews at his time. Because like so many of the I am statements of Jesus, there is deep embedded Jewish culture. And to understand what's going on helps us understand exactly what Jesus is saying. So let's simply start out like this. Let's simply talk about bread first. Bread is... uh, It's one of the universal metaphors um, across all culture, and we use bread to talk about substance. Uh, Bread is a symbol of what we need and what we are created for. Now, in the Jewish culture, bread had that significance, but it had a deeper significance as well. You see, if you read through John chapter 6, you'll notice that John makes a little note. And John says, during chapter 6, it was the Passover season. And so the people are preparing to celebrate the Passover meal together. Now, the Passover meal was a special uh, celebration that basically celebrated God's liberation of the Jewish people from Israel. And basically, the people would have this meal together. They'd slaughter a lamb. They'd have bitter herbs. They'd drink these special cups of wine, and they would have unleavened bread. And the point of the unleavened bread was that the people had to leave Egypt in a hurry, so they didn't have time for the bread to rise. And so the idea of bread was this important part of the Jewish Passover story. But it was also more than that, too. If you remember, after God did deliver the Jews out of Egypt, they were wandering in the desert. Now, of course, if you've been to the desert before, there's not exactly a lot to eat or a lot of water. And so the people got hungry, and they got thirsty, and they cried out to God. And when they cried out to God, Jesus rained down these flakes, and it was called manna, which basically means in in Hebrew, what is it? Um, They also called it the bread from heaven. Now, this bread from heaven rained down in the desert for the 40 years until the Jewish people crossed the Jordan, and at that point, the bread stopped coming down from heaven. Now, One thing you have to understand about the Jewish culture and how the ancient rabbis looked at Scripture is that they didn't look at Scripture often the same way that we do. Um, As maybe Westerners, as people who use logic and we like to kind of take things apart, we often look for truth statements and solid theology in the Scriptures. That's not often how the, the Jews thought about it. See, the Jews saw, when they read the Scripture, they saw deep symbolism, And they almost used the scriptures as a starting point for meditation and reflection to help them discern what God was saying to them and in the days to come. So they would put meaning to the stories in the Old Testament and apply them to what is to come. Now, manna at the time of Jesus had a very special meaning. You see, the ancient Jews believed that when the manna stopped, the reason it stopped was that there was a treasury, like a huge treasure vault in heaven. And what they thought, what they actually wrote in some of their ancient commentaries was that the reason the manna came in the desert was because of the righteousness of Moses. So you think about righteousness as a person who lives completely in God's will and lives the way that God asked them to live. And they believe that his righteousness was like a key that opened the treasury. And because when the treasure was opened, the manna would come down upon the people. And after they crossed the Jordan, that treasury was shut. And the ancient Jews believed this, that one day, When the Messiah came, the the righteousness of the Messiah would again be the key that opened up the treasury. And when the Messiah came, the Messiah would bring the miracle of bread. I want to read to you just a couple of the quotes from some of the ancient uh, Jewish rabbis and literature. This is called... um, This is from a writing called the Second Barak, and this is what they said. They said, the treasury of manna shall descend from on high, and they will eat of it in those years, the years of the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And then in a Jewish commentary in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says this, as the first redeemer caused manna to descend, so 
Will the latter Redeemer, Jesus, also cause manna to descend? For them, a miracle of bread was a reminder of the liberation of the past and a promise of the liberation of the future. So when Jesus does the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, this wasn't just a random miracle because the people were hungry. This was a reenactment of the Passover and Jesus is bringing them, he's bringing them into the story that they have been waiting for. He's saying this now is the time when the treasury is being opened again and God is providing bread from heaven. Now, when Jesus says this originally and he tells the people like he is, like he's the bread from heaven the people understand what he's saying, or at least they kind of understand what he's saying. Because if you read in John chapter 6, when Jesus says that he is the bread, do you know what the people do? The people try to make him their king. In other words, they try to snatch him, basically put a robe on him and say, you are the Messiah, you are the leader. But Jesus isn't ready for it yet, so he slips away and he goes out and he hides. Now, during the night, this is the best, I love this part of the story when you put it in perspective. That night is when Jesus crosses the water. It's the miracle of walking across the water. But when Jesus crosses the water to the other side, he doesn't go to a known location. He actually just crosses and hangs out somewhere. Essentially, Jesus sets up the ultimate game of hide and go seek. Seriously. So, to put this game of hide and seek in perspective, let me give you just a couple like numbers. So a couple weeks ago, Matt McFarland took me out uh, to Don Pedro and we did a little wakeboarding and it was a ton of fun. Well, Don Pedro is roughly 20 square miles and that's a pretty big lake. Like even as we were driving out there, I would get disoriented and lost pretty easy. Of course, I get lost all the time anyways, but that's a big lake. And just imagine if Jesus, I imagine if he crossed that lake and hid somewhere, like it, you might not find him for months. Like that's a pretty like big deal. Well, the Sea of Galilee is roughly 64 square miles. So Jesus takes off by himself. He parks his, well, he didn't park a boat. He was walking on water. He crosses, so there's not even a boat to find. And then he's just somewhere unknown. So in the morning when the crowds wake up, they hear that Jesus went to the other side. He's like, I don't know how many miles exactly, but he's a ways off. So the people go off and find him in like one of the greatest games of hide and go seek. Now, Jesus is gracious and he must have not hidden very well because eventually they did find him. And what I want to do with you this morning is I want to pick up at the moment when they find him because this big game of hide and go seek wasn't just because Jesus wanted to mess with them because sometimes it feels like Jesus wants to do that, but he wanted to teach them. And so let's jump in together. John chapter 6 verses, uh, I don't know that's, Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, here we go. John chapter 6, verses 32 and 33. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Now, what's really interesting about this is that that's not the right PowerPoint slide. And my commitment to you is that I don't edit out my bloopers. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, actually figure out why I have the wrong slide, but I'm going to keep preaching, and I want to actually step you one scripture before this. So I hope you're laughing at home in your living room at Pastor Greg. But here's where I wanted to start. I actually did want to start in verse 25, which I have on my notes here. And so when the people find Jesus, this is how it starts, and then we'll get to this, all right? So when they found him, they asked Jesus, verse 25, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, listen to this, the answer to the hide and go and seek game. 
Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Think about this. They took off on a giant hide-and-go-seat game. They didn't know where they would necessarily get food. It was going to be hot. They would be sweaty and tired. And who knows even if they would find Jesus. They went on an incredible journey to follow Jesus. And now Jesus says, I want to pause a second, and I want to tell you something. I want to help you understand why you're putting so much energy into finding me. And the reason you're coming to find me is not simply because I'm a miracle worker. Because there's other miracle workers and there's other great things that you see. But the reason that you're coming to find me is that you had the bread and you had your fill. I gave you what you needed for life. And that's the reason that you found me. Now, the people totally don't understand what Jesus is saying, which is why they begin to question him. And what they do is they basically ask Jesus to give them another miracle. Now in response to that, this is the scripture that I just read you a second ago, but it must be so good that you get it twice this morning. So here's what Jesus said to them. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Come on, guys. I am the bread of life. You're not just after me because of the miracles. What you need to understand, I am so much more. But this is a hard teaching, you see, because in their understanding, what they thought was that the righteousness of the Messiah would simply open up the heavens and then he would provide the bread, which is what they saw at the feeding of the 5,000. But this is the kicker. Jesus says it's not just that the Messiah gives you the bread. It's that the Messiah is the bread of life himself, and that is who I am. As you need bread to live, you need me to live, and you need to feast on me. Now, I love this little phrase Jesus uses, the bread of life. There's two, basically, two main Greek words you find in the scriptures about uh, life. One is the word bios, which basically means if you think about life just in the sense of having breath and being a cell that divides and you know, the basic I don't know, progression of life as it grows. That's bios life, right? You eat your vegetables and your meat and your ice cream and all those things, and you get to live. But that's not what Jesus says here. He doesn't say, I am the bread of bios. He says, I am the bread of zoe. Now, zoe, that's a different kind of life. I was trying to figure out how to describe this kind of life. And I couldn't quite think of a story, but I had this image in my mind so I was thinking, like, what would be like the Zoe kind of life? And I pictured myself on the beach in a lawn chair with a good drink, with my legs propped up, surrounded by really good music, and hanging out with my family. Have you ever had those moments when you just want to say, ah, this is the life. This is what it means to be truly alive. Um, that's kind of what Zoe life is like. If you've ever had a moment when you've thought, if heaven was like this moment, I would be good forever. Like, that would be described in the Zoe kind of life. And scripture, the Zoe kind of life is marked by eternity. It's marked by happiness and joy and peace and fellowship. Zoe life is the kind of life that we were created to live. And Jesus looks at the people and he says, I am the bread of Zoe. I'm not here just to give you breath in your lungs. I'm here to bring everything that I just talked about. I'm here to give you that sense of, oh, this is what life is supposed to be like. That's what Jesus gives. Now, of course, the people, this really kind of bothers the people 
because they've never thought about the Messiah saying something like this. I mean, it, it sounds like cannibalism in a sense when Jesus says, eat me, and the people are really bothered. Now, one of the things that always strikes me about Jesus is that when the people are confused or bothered, he doesn't take time to calm their senses. Jesus has a tendency to make things worse for people, and that's what he does here because this is how he responded to the people after telling them about the fact he's the bread of life. He goes on and he says this, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, that's his title for himself, and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of of me. And the scriptures say at this point, many of the disciples turned back because they didn't understand what Jesus was doing or what Jesus was saying. But for those who held on, they would continue to learn and to understand what Jesus was trying to say. God is not like the God that humanity has dreamed of for so long. God is not the God who simply sits on the thrones and directs the affairs and uses people as pawns. Uh, a God who needs to be appeased by sacrifices and we, we need to earn his here. God's not like that. God is a father, but God also loves us so much and desires to be unified with us that God enters into creation. And even when Jesus dies and he rises again from the dead, the sending of the Holy Spirit is an opportunity for God to come in union with people. We have a God who desires to be in fellowship with us, who desires to have a relationship with us. Man, I, I love the hide-and-go-seek story. Just imagine the lesson. The people go out and search, and what does Jesus want them to see? Look, you're wanting me because you were created to need me. And what's the lesson here? You know, it's interesting when I think about Christianity or even religions in general. So often we have reasons for doing the things we do. And so often we do things because we're trying to get something out of God or we're trying to feel good about God or we're trying to make ourselves feel better or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. Um, maybe, you know, maybe earn a place to heaven someday. And what we learn from Jesus is that's not where the Christian life is meant to come from. Because here's the deal. When you discover the true source of Zoe, when you discover the gift that says, ah, this is the way it's meant to be, and you discover a treasure and a joy, what do you do? You go on a game of hide and go seek, and even if it's going to be hard to find, you look for it because you want more of it where Ever you can find it. So, I mean, why is it that we live the Christian life? At the end of the day, we live the Christian life because we have found Jesus and we want more of Jesus. And so everything that we do is to know Jesus more and to find him in a deeper way. In our men's group, We've been talking about um, all learning to have a quiet time with God and taking a time each day simply to get in his word and to be with him. And the point isn't just to become like really great scripture memorizers and really great prayers. At the end of the day, the point is we want to be with Jesus and we want to keep seeking him so we can find him and we can taste and see that he's good. And by the way, Taste and see that he's good comes from the Psalms and David talks about his experience with God when he has known the goodness of God. He wants to live his life to find God. One of the reasons that we give to the poor, obviously, it's because we love people. But even beyond that, it's by giving to the poor, we come alongside of God and we get to know Jesus more by giving to the poor. The reason that we serve Jesus is to know him more. See, when you learn and you realize how beautiful Jesus is, how good he is, how life-giving he is, at that point, then we wrap our whole lives around seeking to know him more. And that, that really is about what it means to live the Christian life the way that it's meant to be.
I mean, even one time when Jesus is telling parables and he's trying to help people understand what is his kingdom about, he's like the kingdom of God. It's like this guy who went to a field and he found this amazing treasure and this treasure was the best thing that he could ever get his hands on. So he buries the treasure back in the field where he found it and the scriptures say he went and he sold everything all his possessions because he just had to have the treasure. So he sold it all and he bought the field so he could have that treasure because that's what happens when we see how beautiful and good Jesus is. One of my favorite lines from uh, the Apostle Paul, um, he's he's been talking to the church and he says in Philippians chapter uh, 3 verse 8, he says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. What keeps the Apostle Paul going? What has him going in the midst of torture and persecution and famines and jail time? Because he just wants to know Jesus more. And so this morning, you know, I, I pray for you what I cannot simply convince you of myself, but I pray that God will show you. As David said in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it is my prayer for you this morning that God would reveal himself to you in a deeper and a more beautiful way so that you would know the treasure that he is. But also, it's not just about what God does. It's also about what we do too. And often, God reveals his beauty and the joy when we pursue him. So my invitation to you is just to think about your life and what is it that drives you and invites you to continue. Or maybe you need to restart pursuing Jesus in all the areas of your life. Maybe you're like, you know, maybe you need what we're doing in the men's group. And maybe maybe you need to to slow down every day and spend some time and seek him in prayer or in his word. Or maybe, maybe there's some way God is calling you to serve him or to be sacrificial with your time and your resources. Or maybe, maybe Jesus is just waiting for you to see his face in the face of another person who needs a little bit of love. But I pray that as you continue to seek, God will show himself to you and you will find the joy of knowing him more each and every day. Now, today is also Communion Sunday. So I do invite you, um, I hope at this point you have the elements in front of you with you or your family or those that you are in worship with right now in your homes. And communion is beautiful. Um, You see, Jesus talked about how he's the bread of life. And, um, you know, if if we abide in him, we'll never be hungry or thirsty again. And so he gave us the gift of celebrating his supper together as the church for the last 2,000 years so that we would continue to remember who he is. He's not just a God who's a banker God who sits on the throne, who just makes us pay him debts and keeps score and does all that. It's not what he's like at all. He's a father. He came to this earth and he gives himself to nourish us because he wants to be with us, because he loves us. And this meal is a reminder that we were created for him alone. And it's in him that we find our Zoe kind of life. It's in Jesus we find the moments when we say, ah, this is what life is about. And as we have this meal, it's also a reminder that someday, as Jesus said, we have this meal together as the church pretty often. But someday there's going to be this huge table and we will sit with all of God's children uh, in heaven with Jesus at that table, and we will celebrate the life together. And so this is a foreshadowing of the day when Jesus will heal and restore and redeem everything. So before Jesus went to the cross, he shared this final meal. It's a Jewish Passover meal. And during the meal, Jesus took the bread and he took the bread, and the scriptures say that he, he blessed the bread. He thanked God for the bread, because God gives the bread. And then he broke the bread. And then he said, this is my body, which is broken 
for you. They shared the bread. They shared the rest of the meal. At the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup, which was traditionally the cup of thanksgiving. And Jesus said, this, this cup, this is my blood, and I offer it to you. And he actually called it the cup of the new covenant. And a covenant means a promise. And Jesus was basically saying, now that I'm going to the cross to lay down my life, I am beginning something new. And there's a new promise that all who believe in me shall not perish, but they will have eternal life. The Zoe kind of life here and forever to come. And someday we will have this again in heaven together. So in our particular worship community, as, as you're gathering with us this morning, kind of the way we think about communion, it's not, it's not our table. This is the Lord's table. And wherever your elements are right now, that, that is his table, and we're all sitting at it together. But Jesus invites everyone to his table. And so we allow anyone who professes Christ to join us for this meal, even children. And so, but we always let it up to parents about when they'll do communion. And, and parents, we always invite you to use communion as a chance to teach your kids about Jesus and to then in, allow them to be part of the family as we worship together. So um, let me pray for us. Let's just get in sacred space together around our tables. And then we'll pass the elements together. Lord, we come to your table. We don't force ourselves to your table. But Lord, we come because you saved a seat for us. And you beckoned us and you called us and you said, I want you at my table. And so we come graciously. We come expectantly. We come thank, full of thanksgiving for the invitation to your table. And Lord, I thank you that at your table you serve your people. And so, Lord, as we take um, of, of your body and of your blood from all our different homes this morning, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, that you would bring unity to your church, that you would put love in our hearts. And God, ultimately, what, what this bread and wine is about is about how you fill us. And so we pray that you would fill us with everything that we need, that we would leave this table restored and joyful and hopeful because that is what you do and we need you to do that. So Jesus, we come to receive from you and we say thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So right now, across from your tables, I invite you to serve each other. And maybe you're not sure how, you know, maybe you're not sure what you can say when you serve, but in our family, we serve each other the elements one at a time. We hold up the plate and then we hold up the cup. And what we say is um, we offer the, the bread and we say the body of Christ broken for you. And then we offer the cup and we say the blood of Christ shed for you. And then we sit in silence and we pray and reflect. And so I invite you to do that now. And then in just a few moments, I will close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I have the chills right now just thinking about 
how this table brings together all generations and all races of people. And I just thank you for the unity that we have and that even though we are in our homes, we're not alone and that you are with us. Lord, would you bless your children, my brothers and sisters, and give them all they need in this day and in the days to come. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will eat with you again. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Would you stick around because we are going to enjoy a time of worship together. Hey, um, we're going to sing a song that we haven't sang for quite a while. But as, as you kind of probably have gotten the picture, our family life has just been a little discombobulated lately. And Sam, as we're just talking, and Sam goes, Dad, there's a song that I, I really want you to play. I want you to play the song Cornerstone. And I was like, why is that? He's like, because, because Cornerstone is our family. And I just feel like, like we, need to, we need to think about the fact we're a family because that's what we need right now. And uh, I was saying, you're right, Cornerstone is more than just a church for us. It's, it is our family. And you have been such a blessing to us. And so this song, though, is about um, the head of the family is, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's called Cornerstone. So um, would you join us as we sing together Cornerstone?
He is Lord, and He is so good. So thinking about family and the love of God has been a big theme for us this week. Um, the other theme has been just hope and salvation. And so another kind of theme song for our family is Death Was Arrested. And man, just about how Jesus rose from the dead to give life. Um, he had life. He, he rose to give us life. And we get to live in that life, even, even in a world that has diabetes and racism and war and suffering. There is still life in Jesus. And we're going to keep celebrating that and living that every day. So we're going to sing together, um, Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed and ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart is given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, in my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love. From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, then my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over. displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But heaven did not lose. Goodness was not defeated. But Jesus was victorious and he rose again. So let's sing together. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested. My life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. Song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free. We're free. 
free forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life began. Oh, we're free, we're free forever, we're free. And come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, we're free forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life began. Oh, when death was arrested in my life began. When, when death was arrested in my life began. My Zoe life began, Jesus, because you gave it and you made it possible through the cross. And we thank you for your goodness and for your love. In your name, we pray and worship. Amen. All right. Uh, we have a couple announcements from Casey before we go. Um, and then after announcements, we're actually going to sing our benediction song together. Good morning, church family. Here's your, our latest announcements that we have going for us. So make sure to check out our website. This is where we put our updates. We do have some online groups going right now. So check the links and get in contact with the leaders and jump in. Also, any updates to our COVID-19 policy going on, it's on our website. Uh, we are planning on doing a live recording on Wednesday. So you, for those of you that want to come, you're welcome. We did just receive our new quarterly devotionals. So if you're wanting one, drop me a line somehow, get me a voicemail, send me an email, and I will get one in the mail to you. And remember, uh, we still are checking our mail daily for our giving so you can give online or by the mail. I usually take my kids over there with me to give them a break from their electronics. So again, we really, we're thinking of you church family. We miss you, we love you. We can't wait to be back together. We hope you're all doing well. Stay safe. Amen. Go to his peace and have an awesome week. See you later.